Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, and I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available free for viewing at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is my panelist, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale as an MBA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts, and was retired from the investment banking industry and is now a private investor and venture capitalist. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of concepts and topics in current media and offer an explication of their essence. This week, the subject of for discussion is an article in the Wall Street Journal by Alan Blinder on October 1st, 2012. It's called The Case Against the, a CEO in the Oval Office. And then the subtitle is Why Do Many Business People Fail in Government? because there's no bottom line and compromise is obligatory. Well, I'm going to uh, read a couple of paragraphs from this article. Then we're going to have an opening discussion uh, on some notes and uh, we'll go to our panel. So let's, uh, let's start. Uh, Mr. Blinder is uh, opening paragraph says, but are business achievements important or even relevant to the presidency. Think of our greatest presidents, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and the two Roosevelts. Didn't have any business accomplishments to their credit. Well, maybe Washington did a little. Neither, by the way, did Republican icon Ronald Reagan, who was once a union leader. Harry Truman sold a few hats, and Woodrow Wilson was a professor. On the other hand, the two truly successful businessmen to win the presidency were Herbert Huber, Hoover and George H.W. Bush. This negative correlation between business success and political success is probably not a coincidence, notes Mr. Blinder. The differences between business and government are manifold. Start with democracy, the preservation and strengthening of which may be a president's first duty. Not many successful companies are run as democracies. Benign dictatorship works far better. Further on in the next paragraph, sound companies dote on efficiency. Well, they'd better where the competitive market is a tough environment. Again, later in the article, rather than worship efficiency, some notion of fairness is typically paramount in government. One of the success, key success criteria in politics may be public perceptions of fairness, for perceptions and rea realities don't always line up. Fair dealing may be important in the business world too, but fairness per se, in the sense of everyone getting his or her just desserts, rarely is. Markets are en engines of efficiency, not fairness. Again, later in the next paragraph, top business executives focus single-mindedly on the bottom line, meaning profits. Among the reasons why so many smart business people fail in politics and government is that there is no bottom line. Or perhaps I should say there are so many bottom lines that the search for a single one is futile. In the next paragraph, the crisp political goal analogous to maximizing profits is maximizing your chances 
of re-election. But that ignoble standard, Richard Nixon, was surely one of our greatest presidents and Lincoln one of our worst, notes Professor Blinder. Later, Bain Capital's website says that the firm's mission is to produce superior investment returns for our investors, period. Governments need a wider view. Romney's repeated verbal stumbles bears witness to the differences. I presume he is a whiz with balance sheets and corporate boards. Barack Obama may never have met a payroll, but he's a gifted orator and empathy and fairness are in his bones. So says Professor Blinder. Lastly, Professor Blinder says, setting foreign and military policy is the one place where, as George W. Bush inelegantly, inelegantly put it, the president often is the decider. But it's the rare corporate executive who has any experience in or even much knowledge of these matters. Uh, Mr. Blinder, uh, article here in the Wall Street Journal, is a professor of economics and public affairs at Princeton University. So let's, uh, let's go to a few notes here about the differences between decision making in corporations and decision making in politics. Naturally, a company president or CEO, is, which is what uh, we're speaking of as in a president, decision-making patterns are, are basically the same. The contents are a little bit different, and let's go over that. First, the company president makes a, is a businessman. And as the president, he is beholden to uh, and has to report to the board of directors of the company. In, in the same vein, a president of, a, of the U.S. government or any leader of any, of any government is a politician, just as the businessman is a businessman or as a company president is a businessman. A politician also is beholden to, to some, in some ways, to division in governments, to checks and balances such as the, to the uh, Supreme Court judicial branch and to uh, Congress. Here uh, we have the board of directors that the company president must uh, uh, report to, and they are and they hold the interest of the shareholders theoretically. Congress is and the president are beholden to, and should have the interest of their constituents, that is, the voters of the nation. From this line of thought and from the president of the, of the company having the interests of the shareholders and those interests are priorities those those priorities of the shareholder is profit and on the government side the priorities of the politicians are the welfare of the of the constituents and the voters such as freedom, upholding the Constitution, defense of the U.S., welfare of the people, are some examples. On the company side, there aren't so many priorities. It's basically the profit and the well-being of the corporation. In other words, the president, through the board of directors, needs to maximize the goodness of the corporation. One method of testing that is the amount of profit that a corporation will generate. Here, the president wants to maximize the goodness of the voters so that they may go about their lives and maximize their goodness in their daily lives. 
So what is the difference between the decision making of these two presidents, types of presidents? Well, one, I, I would call this the decision making of the priorities of the corporation. A good, cor a good president uses a methodology to maximize the goodness of the corporation, to maximize the profit. Whatever strategy he might use is incorporated inside his methodology and his knowledge of the corporation and, and knowledge of the marketplace and his products. And from that knowledge, he has a methodology to maximize the goodness. Same with the president, but we're going to call that an ideology. Well, what is an ideology? An ideology is, is how one believes others should, should live. And a political ideology, is which, which is what the president uh, would use, that is how well this should live through government. In other words, the governmental decisions, the, government, the, res the decisions that, a, uh, that uh, a government is responsible for, as noted in the Constitution, would be the political ideology which would allow the president to make his priorities for the nation and for the people. So let's, uh, let's go back to uh, Professor Blinder's uh, article and uh, bring in our discussant and uh, ask Rick what he thinks of the article and whether Professor Blinder's ultimate uh, decision here that businessmen don't generally make good politicians or good presidents. I believe that they certainly can. You just have to swap a methodology and if a, pres if a company president has a good methodology and he can convert it to a good ideology to uphold the goodness and maximize the goodness of the people as opposed to the corporation, I would think that he would have the basic decision-making ability already in place. But let's ask Rick. Rick, what do you think of the article and its conclusions? over um, Mr. Romney's experience as a successful governor uh, and also as a successful manager of the Salt Lake City Olympics. So, you know, this is a man who has happens to have business experience, but has also been successful in other um, pursuits, including government. So, in the first instance, Mr. Blinder's argument seems to fall flat in its face based on the facts. But in the second instance, in a more general way, um, I'm struck by the language of progressivism which uh, is imbued throughout this article and the way it characterizes businessmen. For example, uh, it describes a, a a business leader as somehow ideally a benign dictator. Um, it says that uh, businesses are a game and success is measured uh, simply in terms of money. I mean, these are just, you know, these are very facile uh, generalizations that w would appeal to, you know, the average progressive, but do they have any bearing at all in reality? Uh, I mean, consider your average entrepreneur. Um, is he sort of entering into a monopoly-style game 
where he's keeping score with monopoly money in terms of the success of his business? Or is it more like the following? He has a vision of a product or a service. He puts together a business plan. He struggles to raise capital. Uh, he struggles to hire people. He works feverishly uh, to make the business a success. In many instances, businesses fail and he loses his entire life savings. I mean, the, this is the language of building something. Uh, and that is more what typifies your average business, which in this country tends to be a smaller business, than some sort of uh, mechanistic uh, game as he describes it. So the qualities that he points to that may make a successful business leader are, are, are far too uh, single or double dimensional. It's a, it's a complex, in my personal experience, it's a complex undertaking. You have to be considerate of your employees or they leave. You've got to be careful about where you invest your resources, where you fall behind your competitors. Uh, he, he notes that, in his view, business has very little in the way of rules. Well, actually, that's completely false. They, they operate, almost all businesses operate under extremely complex regulations. So, you know, I, it's hard for me to get by these kind of facile, uh, simplistic generalizations he makes about the nature of a successful business leader uh, to really comment effectively on the comparison he draws. Uh, the sample's way too small. You can't simply point to two presidents who weren't exceptionally successful uh, because they were businessmen, and that made them less than uh, the most successful presidents. I, I, mean, I mean, to me, it's 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 a very poorly thought out, very poorly argued article. So you believe that a businessman certainly could make a uh, an excellent president. Is that well, that's your final conclusion? Romney, Romney has proven he you know in another age Romney would be described as a Renaissance man. He's been successful as a businessman. He's been successful as a governor. He's been successful running an Olympics uh, in Salt Lake City. I mean, what more would you expect? <laughs> right. You know, uh, Professor Blinder did mention uh, about compromise being obligatory. Is um, would a CEO not have uh, <clears throat> that capability already in hand going forward? I would, uh, I would think he would, uh, because in business, uh, isn't it necessary to be able to uh, uh, to uh, to compromise? Well, well uh, absolutely. Uh, you, you have uh, certain lieutenants. Typically in a big business, you've got certain lieutenants, even a big business, certain lieutenants, key lieutenants working for you who have different views on how their parts of the business should operate. And inevitably, in any of the discussions that go forward in the planning that, that occurs in developing a business, there has to be compromise. No one has infinite resources to put into uh, building plants in China versus Europe versus the United States. Choices have to be made. Uh, different leaders of those sub-businesses uh, will have their own uh, uh, agendas. And the overall CEO has to find a way through to the best solution for the business as a whole. Inevitably, there's discussion. Inevitably, there's disagreement. Uh, but choices have to be made. Compromises have to be made. And there is an element of politics in it as well. OK. Let us put, us to, let's put these, um, these uh, decision-making principles now uh, right to work. Let's ask about um, problems that face the president or, or the would-be president uh, soon to uh, uh, when we know next month. What about Middle East? Uh, Middle East is really dominating the headlines right now uh, with the um, problems of the, uh, of the Libya uh, embassy and, and others. What would, uh, if you were president, how would you go forth uh, presently into the, uh, into the problems of the Middle East? 
would there be a, a certain starting point that uh, you'd have to tackle that uh, in order to calm the uh, these these terroristic these happenings that are that are almost every day in the media right now I guess uh, I heard one day uh, that the uh, in Libya alone there were 250 in the last year uh, acts of, uh, of violence um, that the uh, embassy noted and uh, and communicated back to uh, the US about as a new president or as a return president, how would you tackle this problem, Rick? Well, the Middle East is a, a rather large question and almost uh, worthy of a separate program. But in the case of Libya, uh, there seems to be have been an element of political spin uh, whereby the administration, despite having lowered some of the security associated with that embassy uh, in advance of the attack, which by the way was on the anniversary of 9-11, uh, then tried to make it seem as if the attack was the result of this uh, video. Uh, what's becoming clear is that's not the case. This was pre-planned, uh, that the embassy should have been better prepared and, you know, tragically, uh, the ambassador and others died. Um, the point now is where do you go from here? Uh, the mistake that was made, in my view, is that the uh, administration, you know, is blaming a random video and trying to deflect any blame on itself and not coming out and it didn't certainly come out fast enough with a strong objection to the violence and an indication that action would be taken uh, directly and indirectly to ensure that the terrorists were brought to justice. And if that meant uh, certain U.S. intervention uh, in selective instances, that's, that's what's required. Uh, but if terrorists believe that uh, the United States is going to allow, you know, embassies to be blown up and ambassadors to be killed and not do anything about it, well, what's to stop them from continuing? Yeah, you're right that uh, the problem of the Middle East is something we need to uh, discuss fully on a, 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 and separately on a different program. So uh, we'll put that off into the future. Um, and moving on to uh, something like national defense or welfare, you as a, as a former businessman in the investment banking industry, how would you approach some of the problems uh, such as the national deficit? Uh, should you be president in the next term? The warnings, the warning shots have already been fired. The U.S. debt has been downgraded, uh, not because of any uh, lack of resolution on the part of Congress and arguments uh, concerning raising the debt ceiling. It's because our ability to service that debt is diminishing over time, and markets are taking notice of that. Uh, what we know will happen, and what has happened with other countries, is that beyond a certain tipping point, the, the cost of servicing debt for any country, whether it's the United States or a, another country, uh, starts to rise uh, in a very inconvenient way and causes many more problems. So the point is that you don't want to reach that stage and you want to stay well clear of it so that the disruptions that we've seen in Greece and, and other countries because they can't service their debt uh, don't happen here. We don't want to see 25% unemployment plus. I mean, we're, you know, 8% uh, plus is bad enough, or whatever it actually is, higher than that. But uh, we don't want to see a catastrophic event of the like we've seen in Greece. So actions have to be taken to cut 
spending. We're spending 50% more than we take in. You cannot raise taxes to the level that covers that difference. You kind of made an equation between unemployment and the uh, national deficit. Is, that a, is there a real relationship there? Well, it, 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 in the case, let's take Greece as an extreme example. Um, what happens when there's a fear that the government will default uh, or that, in their case, uh, Greece will leave the euro because it can't service euro-denominated debts, is there's a loss of confidence, right? So uh, Greeks themselves ship their money out. Businesses don't invest. Companies don't hire or they fire and work on a bare-bones basis. Uh, actions are taken uh, at, the, at the margin that are very, very extreme in an atmosphere of fear of the sort that we're observing right now in Greece. Uh, and that uh, is very, very damaging to economic output. That's where the real effects take place. Uh, so you don't ever want to come close to those conditions where fear prevails and extreme actions are taken by both individuals and businesses uh, such that you can't attract capital. In fact, it flees. Uh, and even um, your, your workers will over, over time will flee. So I mean, th it, it's one thing for there to be a signal uh, that your 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 costs of borrowing are rising and you better do something about it and the United States hasn't quite reached that point yet uh, but it, it soon will at this rate uh, it's another thing for that to reach a, a, a later stage where there is real economic effects and disastrous uh, economic implications for the welfare of the people living in that country okay, okay. and I happen to agree and, but that's about all the time we have for this discussion and this week on the Philosophical Angle. Join us next time. Thanks very much for joining us.